Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews. I'm glad to be back with you again today. Today, I'm talking about EEG, electroencephalogram, and this comes out of the blue book right there. So let's go ahead and get started. Hello, my friends. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews. I'm excited to do EEG with you today. I don't do a lot of diagnostic test videos, but this is one that you absolutely need to know for your NCLEX. And you know this is primarily an NCLEX review channel. We're part of the greater Clinic Review organization. Mark Clinic started Clinic Reviews probably 40 years ago. He's getting close to retirement, but he is still doing Clinic Reviews. You can see him live in person. If you want to go to clinicreviews.com and sign up for one of his live three-day NCLEX reviews, or you can get the same review online on demand. It's 21 plus hours of NCLEX prep. It is by far the very best NCLEX prep in the entire universe, in my opinion, and you should sign up for it if you've been struggling to pass. We offer this channel free of charge to you as a service to you because there's things that we don't cover in our NCLEX prep, and we want to offer information to you free of charge for those of you who may not be able to afford to take the clinic review. We also offer a streaming service and small group tutoring. I teach two of the tutorings and um, Pete Savard teaches the other two, and I do the next gen, which is why I don't do next gen on this channel. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with EEG. It's not particularly complicated, uh, which is why you definitely should watch this so that you don't miss these. You don't want to miss these questions if you don't have to. The nurse is reviewing medication records for a scheduled EEG, which drug must be withheld unless the provider specifically orders otherwise. Acetaminophen, omeprazole, metoprolol, or lorazepam. So an EEG electroencephalogram is like doing an EKG of the head. So they put they actually do put electrodes on the head and they record brain waves. So this is done for a number of different reasons. Primarily it's done to detect seizure activity. It can also be done if people have severe headaches or migraines. It can also be done to detect brain waves if they think the person is non-responsive or if they find the person is non-responsive. So those are some different reasons they can do that. Um, acetaminophen is Tylenols for headache. It doesn't do anything to change brainwave activity. Omeprazole decreases gastric acid secretion, doesn't change brainwave activity. Metoprolol is a beta blocker. It does not change brainwave activity. And lorazepam is a benzodiazepine. It could be ordered. Sometimes they order for sedation. They order sedation depending on what the purpose of the diagnostic test is. Um, but lorazepam should not be given at all unless you have an order to give it. So only give it if it's a EEG with sedation, in which case you can give it, but this specifically says what should be held uh, unless the provider specifically orders it. A patient asks whether the EEG will be painful, which response by the nurse is best. It is painless. The electrodes only record brain waves. You may feel mild shocks, but they are brief. You will be sedated, so you won't feel anything. Discomfort is minimal, like having blood drawn. So I told you this is like having an EKG of your brain waves, and an EKG is not painful, y'all. So you should tell them it's painless. They only record brain waves. There's nothing going into the patient, okay? There's no shocks, nothing. There should be no discomfort. It's just recording brain waves. Four clients are scheduled for routine outpatient EEGs this morning, which client requires the nurse to contact the healthcare provider. Client with well-controlled epilepsy who washed their hair last night. Client with a migraine who has not had any caffeine for 24 hours. Client with new onset seizures who took phenytoin one hour ago. Client with suspected sleep apnea who was sleep deprived per orders. You know, they do do sleep deprived EEGs. And if they order a sleep deprived EEG, then they should be sleep deprived per order. So D is okay. So when do we contact the healthcare provider? We can contact the healthcare provider when something occurs that's unexpected. A is not unexpected. They should have washed their hair last night, no conditioner. Uh, but if they wash their hair last night, that's perfectly fine. 
client with a migraine who's not had any caffeine for 24 hours. Caffeine should be withheld for 24 hours. They may have a migraine because they haven't had caffeine for 24 hours, or maybe they get migraines and that's why they're having an EEG done. It's not a contraindication to an EEG. Client with new onset seizures who took phenytoin. So phenytoin is an anti-seizure med. If they may be trying to induce seizures, I don't know what they're trying to do, but anti-seizure meds can certainly change the outcomes. So I would need to contact the healthcare provider and say, hey, they took their anti-seizure med. Is that a contraindication or are you okay with that? All right. So C is the one that I would need to contact the healthcare provider about. The provider writes EEG with photic stimulation to rule out juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which pretest teaching takes priority. You will watch a strobe light that may trigger jerking movements. We will record brain waves while you solve mouth problems. No food or drink eight hours before the test. Expect a brief needle electrode to be inserted. So photic, photo, think photo, it's lights. Um, so it, it's actually blinking lights, seeing if they can induce a, um, a seizure. That's what photic stimulation is. Um, they don't have to be NPO. The only reason they have to be NPO for a few hours is if they're doing sedation with, so if they're doing an EEG with sedation, they may ask them to be uh, NPO for a few hours, but otherwise there's no need to be NPO for an EEG and there's no needle inserted during an EEG. So D is out. Provider orders an urgent bedside EEG for a patient who is not waking after a tonic-clonic seizure, which nursing action takes priority. Remove excess hair oil from the scalp ensure suction equipment is functional, place the bed in high Fowler's position, turn off sedating IV infusions. Okay, so we have a patient who's not waking up. So what do I want to do first? Remove excess hair oil from the scalp. Well, we have an emergency one, removing excess hair oil from the scalp. I mean, that's nice, but that doesn't seem like what I would do in an emergency situation. Ensure suction equipment is functional they're not waking up, I need to make sure their airway is clear. So I definitely want to do B, place the bed in high Fowler's position. Maybe, maybe, I mean, they usually are sitting up for these. I'm not sure that that's my priority though. Turn off sedating IV infusions. Um, I mean, gosh, if they've got, I guess I would need an order for that. Um, I don't know if they want them to have sedating IV infusions. So this is a prioritization. This is a best, what's best. And so what they're really testing here is, do you understand what the fundamental principle is related to this situation? And I don't think the fundamental situation, the fundamental principle here is about oil or positioning, okay? Because this person's not waking up and it's an emergency EEG. So A and C don't seem like fundamental principles that I should be focusing on here. However, I'm worried about airway and I might be worried about sedating IV infusions. So here's the thing. I know I have to worry about airway. I'm not sure about sedating IV infusions. Do you know what I, the principle I want you to remember is pick the answer you're sure about, not the answer you're not sure about. I know I have to ensure airway is open for this patient. They just had a tonic clonic. They're not waking up. I have to make sure the airway is open but I'm not sure about the IV infusion. So pick, this is, remember this, pick the answer you're sure about, not the answer you're not sure about. Y'all, that will get you a lot of right answers because it's not at all uncommon to get a question where you go, oh, I know B is good, but man, C, maybe, maybe C is good. Don't pick C, pick B. You know, you know B is good. Pick B, don't pick C. A client scheduled for a sleep-deprived EEG slept five hours last night and now feels exhausted. Okay, which nursing action is most appropriate? Allow for a 30-minute nap before the test. Give prescribed Zolpidem to induce deeper sleep. Encourage the client to stay awake until after the EEG. Reschedule the test for another day. So the question is, what's the purpose of a sleep-deprived EEG? Is the purpose to let them sleep while we're doing the EEG? That doesn't make a lot of sense. It seems like they would want to see if sleep deprivation can induce a seizure. So if we want to see if sleep deprivation can induce a seizure, it doesn't make sense that I would let them take a nap or give them something to fall asleep. B doesn't make sense. And D doesn't make sense because it seems like they were tired because we want them to be. So we need to encourage the client to stay awake until after the EEG. 
as what you do with a sleep deprived EEG. During electrode application, the patient becomes anxious about electric shocks, which teaching strategy should the nurse use first? Describe each step while performing it, show a short video demonstrating the procedure, provide written materials for later reading, ask another nurse to continue the setup. All right, they're anxious about getting electric shocks. Well, we know they're not going to get electric shocks, okay, because that's not what an EEG is. So I don't see how D is going to help, and I don't see how C is going to help providing written materials for later reading. That doesn't make sense. Like they're anxious now. I need to address their anxiety now. So do I want to show a short video? Is it more effective to show a short video to relieve their anxiety or to describe each step while I'm performing it? So if I say, okay, now I'm going to just put electrodes on. I'm just cleaning the scalp, I'm just putting the electrode on. Now I'm hooking up the, the wire. There's no shock that's going to come through here. It just seems like it would make more sense to describe each step while I'm performing it than to stop and show them a video. Like we want to address their anxiety immediately. And A is the most immediate addressing of the anxiety and their anxiety about something that's not going to happen. So it's not like we have to stop it and like teach them about it and then come back later. I mean, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Like I can just describe it while I'm putting the electrodes on. A patient scheduled for an ambulatory 24-hour EEG asks how to keep the electrodes secure, which statement is most important. So this is a best question, which means there's some fundamental principle they need to remember while undergoing a 24-hour EEG. A 24-hour EEG means that they're going to wear it for 24 hours, they're going to go home with it, and they're going to monitor for seizure activity while they're going about their activities of daily living. Avoid vigorous exercise while the leads are attached. Wear a loose hat or scarf to prevent lead displacement. You can shower as long as you don't wet your head. If an electrode falls off, reattach it with tape. All right. Well, I know C is not right. We're not going to have them shower while they're getting a 24-hour EEG. I know we want them to do ADLs, but it doesn't make sense that I'd want to tell them they can shower if the purpose is to keep the electrodes secure. So. That's the thing is the purpose. We got to answer the questions being asked. How do you keep the electrodes secure? So, well, reapplying it with tape, if it falls off, keep the electrodes secure. That seems like that doesn't make a lot of sense. That, that seems more like what do you do if the electrode comes off? It's not answering how do you keep it secure? So I'm going to cross off C and D. So wearing a loose hat or scarf will help keep the electrodes secure. Maybe. Maybe I, it seems like it would be better to maybe wear something a little tighter around the head to keep them. I don't know if a loose hat or scarf is going to help, but maybe avoid vigorous exercise while the leads are attached. Now that seems like that would help prevent how to keep the electrodes secure. It seems like avoiding vigorous exercise to, will help keep the electrodes secure over a loose hat or scarf to keep the electrodes secure. So I say, well, I'm not sure if B is right. It seems like a, 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 a secure hat might be better, but I know avoiding vigorous exercise while the leads are attached will help keep the electrodes secure. So what did I tell you about answering the question you know is right versus the answer you're not sure about? Pick the answer you know is right versus the answer you're not sure about. Y'all, I want you to get that in your head. You have to have that rule in your head. Otherwise, you're going to second guess yourself and pick the answer that isn't right just because you're like, well, maybe. Okay. If you're a person who second guesses yourself and tends to pick the wrong answer, say, am I sure this is right? Which, which one am I sure is right? Well, I know A is right. Well, then pick A, y'all. Okay. The nurse prepares to discharge a patient after an outpatient EEG with hyperventilation and photic stimulation, which post-test instruction is highest priority. You may shampoo your hair to remove the gel. Report any prolonged dizziness or headache. Resume your usual medications unless told otherwise. Do not drive until you feel fully, fully alert. So what's best when discharging a patient after an outpatient EEG with hyperventilation? So they're breathing fast. And hyperventilation means they're actually blowing off too much CO2. So I think they would be dizzy. And photic stimulation. So they had photic stimulation. So they could... They could have a seizure. So is it important 
when discharging a patient to say you may shampoo your hair to remove the gel. Well, you, they can sh shampoo their hair to remove the gel, but I don't know that that's a priority here. Report any prolonged dizziness or headache. Okay, I maybe, yeah, I'm okay with B. Resume your usual meds unless told otherwise. Okay, do not drive until you feel fully alert. Now, if we think about Maslow's hierarchy, safety comes second. Second, the first is addressing any physiologic concerns, okay? And addressing any physiological concerns. Not saying, tell me if they stay, but like doing something for the physiologic concern. So the physiologic concern is hyperventilation and photic stimulation, but there's no, there's no interventions here to address the hyperventilation and photic stimulation which means safety has to be second and driving right after an EEG when you're symptomatic after an EEG doesn't seem like a good idea. So if I were to say D is a safety issue, then I would want to make sure that we do that. That's the best way I know how to, to describe how to answer this question is that it's really focusing on safety. It's not that A, B, and C are wrong. Um, a, B, and C are all good interventions, but they're not the priority here. The priority is making sure the patient stays safe. And highest priority or best questions are always conceptual. It's frustrating when you get a best question because you think, well, I got to do them all. Well, that's true, and you in real life, you could do them all. But on an end, the end collects are saying, but if you can only do one, which one do you have to do? And remember, this is, this is a theoretical question because in real life, you can always do all of them. So you have to say to yourself, it's not about that I really need to do them all. That's not really what it's saying. It's saying, if you can only do one, if you can only do one, which one do you have to do? And you go, I have to protect their safety and I'm discharging them from an outpatient EEG. So they got to get home somehow. So I'm going to say don't drive un unless you are fully alert. Okay. So I hope that this was helpful to you. Um, this is how not only do you answer EEG questions, but I also talked a little bit about prioritization and how do you answer best questions and answering the question you know is right rather than the answer you're not sure about, okay? So I hope that was helpful to you. Good luck on your NCLEX. You can absolutely pass. Even if you failed in the past, you can absolutely pass this time. And if you're getting ready to take it for the first time, you have to go in conf confident. You have to go in saying, I am going to pass. Remember, you have to be ready for 155 questions. Otherwise, you could sabotage yourself. So it's nice if it shuts off at 85, but you've got to be ready for 155, okay? Because otherwise, when it flips over to 86, you go, ugh, I failed. You didn't fail. As long as you're still getting questions, you're still passing. So you need to celebrate when it goes to 86 and go, yes, I'm still passing. When it goes to 120, you go, yes, I'm still passing, okay? So as long as you're still getting questions, you're still passing. All right, good luck. Thank you for being a part of the Clinic Review family.